In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Nice to see you all again, along with many of our kids. I was away at the Antiochian Village for camp uh, these past two weeks. Camp at the village is as it is in most camps. It's fun. We sing songs in the dining hall. We have campfires. The kids can choose to do archery and canoeing. There's all kind of fun games during the day and in the evening. But I'm happy to tell you that camp at the Etiokan village is much more than just fun and games. These campers that you're seeing, some of them anyway, for the last two weeks have gone to church not just every day. They went to church twice every day. They went to church in the morning and sang either the matin service or a service of supplication. And they came back to the church in the evening for vespers or another supplication service. Three different times throughout this session, they came to the Holy Liturgy. On Sunday, the entire camp was there not just for liturgy, but for matins. And for those of you who feel that I have been so rough on you this year with your standing, they stood the entire time. Two and a half hours straight. They sat for the homily as you're sitting now. Some people say, why is camp like that? In my 10 years as a camp director, I heard lots of complaints from parents, interestingly. Not the kids, the parents. Father Michael, they would say, why so much church? We send the kids to camp to play, to have fun. And what the parents don't understand is what the kids come to understand. That that lifestyle, that full and complete Orthodox Christian lifestyle that the kids live for two weeks straight is not too much for them. And if you ask them, almost all, I won't say all of them, but almost all will tell you that's what they miss the most. We offer them the chance to come to confession while they're at camp. We don't make them. That is an option. But I can tell you from my two to three hours, not once, but three times throughout the session, many of them wanted to come. And my fellow session priest, Father John Dixon, said to me, these aren't your typical quick confessions. I'm happy and proud to tell you that our kids confess, and they confess deeply and thoroughly. You might be shocked by the things that I hear in confession. I'm thankful that I hear it. Thoughtful, deep, heartfelt and repentant confessions from our kids, not just the teenagers, from the little ones. What I learned at camp in my 10 years, and I learn every year that I go back, is that our kids are much more capable than we give them credit for. You know, in some churches, in fact, the fasting growing portions of Christianity today, kids don't go to church. You say, Father Michael, you're making it up. I'm not making it up. Kids don't go to church. It is thought that a half hour or 45 minutes of singing and a homily is too much for the kids, so the kids go to a children's program. At most summer camps, the kids don't go to church twice a day. They might go once a week, sometimes more often, or for a short prayer service, not for a full 45 minutes for a Vespers or a Matins. But our Orthodox Church knows what kids are capable of, and more than that, the church knows what our kids need. It is not by accident that the Antiochian village has produced a steady stream of clergy. Continual throughout the history of the village, there are clergy that come and that tell their people, like I will tell you, that the experience of the village was critical in what led us to understand what it means to serve the church and the holy priesthood. 
Our Orthodox Church not only welcomes our kids to come to church, we baptize them as babies. We say that even an infant is capable of receiving the fullness of the gift of the Holy Spirit. This morning we were blessed to witness the chrismation of an adult. But we chrismate and confirm our kids, infants on up. Even our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters don't understand how, but we give communion to our infants. We don't say they're not capable of understanding. In fact, quite the contrary. We listen to the voice of our Lord, who didn't say, kids, when you grow up, then you can be full members of the church. Our Lord looked at us, the adults, and he said, and I will quote, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. My brothers and sisters, living the fullness of Orthodox Christian life, I assure you, is not beyond the capability of our kids. And my main message to you today is especially to you who are parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and godparents to fully understand not only what our kids can receive from the church, but believe me when I tell you that more and more they need to receive what the church has to offer them. When we talk about the Holy Scriptures, we say that the Scripture is the canon of faith. It's the ruler by which we measure truth. But we don't only canonize sacred writings, we canonize people. We say that the saints that we declare to be saints who adorn our church are the rulers. They're the measurements by which we need to measure ourselves. And so often we understand, or hopefully we understand, that we don't often enough measure up. The saints for us are not the exception. They are the norm. And as just one example, I want to tell you the story this morning of the life of one of the saints of the church that we remember today, the holy martyr Marina. The kids at camp know about her. In fact, the girls probably know a lot about her. She is the patron saint of one of their groups of cabins. St. Marina learned of Christ at the age of 12, not even a teenager. She was so enthralled with the teachings of Jesus Christ that against the wishes of her pagan parents, she declared openly her faith at a time when doing so was cause for death. She declares her faith. Her father tries to get her to stop. And when she doesn't obey him because she's obeying her heavenly father, he has her arrested. He declares that he is no longer her father and she, he leaves her to the authorities for punishment that he hopes was going to turn her away from what he thinks are her stupid ways following this Jesus Christ that she grew to love. Takes her to the governor, Olimbrius. Olimbrius sees this young girl, 12 years old, and in his twisted nature decides, I know what I'll do, I'll marry her. I'll make her my governor's wife. She'll live in royalty. Not only is she beautiful, he thought, this is how I can show the Christians how weak it is to follow the Christian faith. When she has nothing of it, he has her beaten and thrown into prison. And there is little Marina, 12 years old, having given up by her parents, tortured by the authorities, she finds herself in prison beaten and bloodied. And she prays. Like the saints always do, she prays. She's given two visions in prison. And the first was quite the horror. As she prayed, a serpent appeared. She didn't know if it was real or not. She continued to pray. 
The serpent came up and crawled onto her and wrapped itself around her head. Still, she didn't lose her faith. She simply made the sign of the cross. And that fantasy, that phantom of a serpent disappeared. And she continued to pray. When another vision appeared, this time a cross, brilliantly lighting up her prison cell. And on top of that cross was a beautiful dove. And miraculously, the dove spoke to her and said these words, Rejoice, Marina, thou dove of Christ, daughter of Zion that is on high, for the day of thy joy is drawing near. And Marina rejoiced. That 12-year-old girl, having endured such tortures and horrors, rejoiced knowing her death was coming. Such is the faith that is capable of a 12-year-old. My brothers and sisters, I know we all love our kids. We love them and we want the best for them. But again, specifically to you that are parents that care for children, don't misunderstand what they need. We all want them to get a good education. We all want them to live comfortably in this life. And perhaps not often enough, but we all want it. We want them to be in the church. But sometimes we don't understand all that they need. We think that bringing them on Sunday, maybe on time, maybe not, and bringing them for an hour or so, and then running off. We think it's enough. Trust me when I tell you, the world that they are growing up in, let alone the world they're going to grow up in, necessitates a deep and secure spiritual life. Almost every year I do an exercise with the kids. And I say to them all, stand up if you think you're going to be going to church and practicing orthodoxy in 20 years. And they all stand up. And then I tell them the reality. And this is not my opinion, this is fact, this is statistics. I tell them, I say, half of you sit down. And they look around and half sit and about half stand. I say, do it again, half of you sit down. And I do it again till they're about 15 or 20 percent. And I say, look around. And they look around at most of them sitting down. And one in four, one in five still standing. And I say, this is the reality. Unless you do differently than what your older brothers or your aunts and uncles have done. My brothers and sisters, I don't need to tell you that there are lots of our children, no longer children, now adults, but no longer here. When I ask you to bring your kids to church school and bring them on time, whether that's coming early or not, when I say to you, send them to the camp, I know they're going to miss their mom and dad. They'll get through it, trust me. I was one of those homesick kids that camp director had ever seen when I went to camp. When I tell you, have them come to Teen Soil, I'm not just trying to build up numbers. I'm trying to help you raise your kids in the faith. Not only do they need it, but they can do it. There's much darkness in the world. I don't have to tell you that. You all hear the news. But today's gospel gives us hope. Jesus told his followers that you are the light of the world. Imagine the kind of darkness that's going to be in the world in five and ten years. Will it be dark? It doesn't matter what the terrorists think. It doesn't matter what tyrants and dictators want. They're going to do their thing no matter what. The darkness in this world will matter on us and on our kids. Will we have raised them to be the light of the world that the world needs? Jesus didn't say, you're the light of the world, and they might have other lights. He said, it's us. In another verse, he says that when there's darkness, how great is that darkness? 
Believe when I tell you, they can do it and they need to do it. So I want to encourage you. Help your kids, your nieces, nephews, your grandkids, and even the kids that aren't your kids. They're just kids that sit next to you in church or kids of your friends in the church. Encourage them. Help them. Guide them. And most of all, equip them. Are you praying at home? If not, start today. Before you partake of food, stand as the kids stand at camp and say the Our Father together. Don't teach them that camp is one world and then there's the real world where people don't pray. Teach them the reality of what it means to live a Christian life. And then don't stop there. Because Jesus' warning to us is that we need to become like them. No, we don't need to become childish. We don't want our kids to be childish. There's time for play, but there's also time to see what they're capable of. No, it's time that we imitate them and become childlike. Not worrying about all the silly things we worry about in the world and thinking about the important things to think about. If we can do that, then like St. Marina and like all the saints, we will understand what the new norm is about, what it means to follow Christ no matter what. No matter what temptations come their way in the future, they'll be ready for them and ready to make the right decision. May we teach them by our words and more importantly by our example to follow our great and loving God who wants nothing for, my, uh, for us more than to love us and to save us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Camper, stop hiding and go help them out.